are doing the most contentious of all Orange Order marches. Here, the 12th of July usually means trouble, from one side or the other. Last year, the North Belfast Parade descended into chaos. The violence lasted for three days and was broadcast around the world. As protesters danced, water cannon were brought in. Officers were injured in the clashes. Within the last few minutes, Mr Dodds has been knocked unconscious by missiles thrown during the demonstration. Nigel Dodds was one of several people injured that day, all because three Orange Lodges were prevented from marching home along their traditional route. One of the bands involved in the parade was the Pride of Ardoin flute band. I was there on the 12th, making a documentary. As the parade became a riot, we were asked to stop filming and leave by a man we believed to be a paramilitary. We watched from the other side of the police lines as loyalists rioted long into the night. This year, for the past number of weeks, Spotlight has been given unique access to people on both sides of this bitter dispute. From Republicans who want to see an end to the parades in this part of Belfast, to loyalists who say they'll never give up trying to complete the march they started almost a year ago. For the Pride of Ordoin band who I filmed with last year, these protests are becoming a fact of life. So how many people do this tonight? About 50 or 60, I think. Right. And how often are you doing this protest period? We're on Monday night, but there's people that are seven days a week. Every day? Yeah, every day a week. There's always somebody there. This is Gary Wells. He's the lead drummer in the Pride of Ardoin flute band. The last time I filmed with him, he explained how much being in the band meant to him. It's always been nerve, you know what I mean? It's, it's part of my life. It's kind of always been practice every week, but praise most weekends. It's just, it's, it's been part of me growing up. I've always been there. Good to see you again. I remember you from last year. Hi, how are you? Good to see you again. Um, These days, the protest parades every night and on Saturdays mean that the band is an even bigger part of Gary's life. Is that it? That's us, awesome, isn't it? You must be devoting a lot of time to this protest, are you? I mean, is this every night? We're happened doing every night. We've done every Saturday from the 12th, so it's over 300 days. It's just something I have to do. The bands and their supporters have set up a protest camp on Twiddell Avenue. There, I meet band leader Michael Crosby. He too has been here almost every day since the protest began. We walk around the corner to Woodville Road. Each night, the protest march begins again, close to where the original parade was stopped by police. But, but there'd be this amount of police every night, would there? Yep. Monday to Saturday. What could cost a fortune? Between 35 and 45,000 pounds a night. A night? Yeah. So 35,000 pounds a day. So they're going towards other things. Yeah. yeah. Even today, the police presence here is overwhelming. Since the 12th of July last year, policing these protests has cost in excess of nine million pounds. The Nicelands don't want a parade up they, or down the road. They just don't want a return parade. They just don't parade. want a return parade. So what do we do? I mean, do we... I don't know, we just... So we need to get home. Hopefully it'll not be chaos like last year. I mean, nobody wants that. Tonight, the atmosphere is calm, even jovial. <laughs> Very different to the last time I was here. Do you remember coming from here on the 12th night? Oh, I'll never forget it. It was unbelievable. It was... Um, I don't forget, there was about 2,000 people already there. Yeah. I remember um, it all seemed to happen very quickly. Like, once you got up to the police lines, within minutes there was water cannon going. It, My wife brought me down shorts and a T-shirt and a chair. We thought we were protesting to stand there. But we couldn't even get a chance. They just hit us with water cannons. And... I mean, it, it, it just got really 
violent really, really quickly. The violence spread across Belfast. 32 police officers were injured at Woodville alone. Since the last 12th of July, 238 people have been charged with public disorder across Greater Belfast. This eventually gave way to the nightly protest marches. Tonight, the bands are about to begin march number 309. The march itself takes about 15 minutes and the bands play music for another 15 minutes when they get near the semi-permanent camp at Twadell Avenue. For the last few months, they have adhered to the determinations laid down by the Parades Commission. But that wasn't always the case. No notice of this public accession has been given to a member of the Police Service of Northern Ireland. In the early days of the protests last summer, the behaviour of some bandsmen and protesters went too far, according to former Parades Commissioner Brian Kennaway. Well, the behaviour was certainly not in keeping with the core values of the Orange Institution. It is being undermined very seriously by the behaviour at Trudell, when we find people with orange banners dancing and singing the words of the famine song. Now, that is simply not on in terms of trying to reach an accommodation with the community. The PSNI have confirmed that since the 12th of July last year, there have been 76 breaches of Parades Commission determinations at Woodville Road and Twardell Avenue. They say that 20 people have been arrested and that their inquiries are ongoing. At Camp Twardell, Orangeman Gerald Salinas offers to show me around. So this is Camp Forel. Yes. Is this actually legal? I mean, I know the parades are legal and adhering to determinations, but is it legal to be on this patch of ground? I'm not sure. <laughs> do you not, so do, not, do, I, do you not I, care? I, I, I do believe that, uh, that there's no law against it within the UK mm -hmm. on a derelict piece of land. Mm -hmm. That's what I believe. I'm not sure whether it's tr truthfully awful or not. So this is our, our, our catering porta cabin. This is quite a setup here, I must yeah. admit. Who pays for all this? It all comes for donations. The donations come from all around the world, from Australia, America, from England, Scotland and Wales. And various businessmen have all donated towards the camp campaign. And what happens if it doesn't go in your favour, if you don't get that return leg of the march? Well, we'll just stay here and we'll keep protesting. For as long as it takes? As long as it takes, basically. Camp Twadell is no more than 20 metres away from nationalist and republican parts of Ardoin and is seen by many on the other side as an unwelcome aggravation. There have been several incidents of violence against the camp. In December, shots were fired from Ardoin towards police, and there have been two incidents where flags and banners have been attacked. But for the most part, the presence of the camp has not led to serious ongoing unrest. Partly that's down to people like Father Gary Donegan, who lives in the Holy Cross Monastery, which overlooks the flashpoint. I've always said, we're always two golf balls away here from a riot. Every night, he patrols the streets with other interface workers, trying to keep young nationalists away from the camp. If he sees a group of young people congregating, he tries to get them to move on. Started off the first night, 1,800 people, and it went on till two, three in the morning. The first and night then, of the, the Twadell camp? Twadell thing, yeah. And, uh, and then it basically, it just got smaller. Um, till it went to hundreds, then it went down to dozens. Mm -hmm. And then as the nights wore on, what happened was it, it ended up then basically a few young people. But the last thing they want is to have a priest stand in the middle of their gang because he kind of interferes with the conversation. So you disperse yeah. them by ruining their street cred? That's basically. it, that's it. Some people in Ardoin see the camp at Twadell not as a peaceful protest, but as a provocation. D Fennell is one of them. He's the spokesman for the Greater Ardoin Residence Collective, also known as GARC. He has lived in Ardoin all of his life. In 1971, his grandmother was shot and seriously injured in disturbances following an Orange Order parade past Ardoin. What is your opinion of 
Camp Twiddell and the, and the effect it's had on this community? People in this area, we live cheek by jaw, but people in Shangle, we know who UVF personnel are. Um, we see UVF men at it uh, on a regular basis daily. Basically, it's a, it's a bigot fest. It's a hate camp. Um, and I think basically the people need to go away. On Saturdays, speeches are given to the assembled crowds at Woodville Avenue. They often involve representatives from the Orange Order sharing a platform with loyalist leaders. Here, one of those leaders, Winston Irvine, shares a podium with Mervyn Gibson from the Orange Order. Last year, Spotlight investigated Winston Irvine's links with the UVF and named him as a senior UVF commander in Belfast. He strenuously denies that allegation. What do you make of the criticism from the Republican side and others that there is heavy involvement from people who are known to be involved in the UVF? I can assure you from the inside that it is a united loyalist front and unionist front. The political parties there, the Ulster Unionist Party, the Democratic Unionist, the Progressive Unionist Party. There are people there from local bands, local communities. The three local lodges are there, supported by Orange from around the country. So it's not a solo run by anybody. And do you see any kind of problem with, say, someone like yourself or, or Orange leaders sharing platforms with people who are known to have paramilitary links? Do you accept that that's a problem? Well, I always find that a strange question because we have a government where the deputy leader of that government is a, a known IRA leader. So why is there always a question when somebody stands on a platform with, every, with whoever? Because everybody in this country has got a past. Uh, it doesn't mean they can't have a future. If it applies to the deputy first minister, it applies to anyone who stands with us in today. So do you think it is, it's wrong for, for leading Orangemen? or leading unionist politicians to, to stand beside people who have clear paramilitary links? Well, it, it's, not, it's not just clear paramilitary links in the past. It's, the perception is that there's still paramilitary links today. And because of that, it is therefore certainly, in my humble opinion, quite immoral. To Orangemen, the Parades Commission's decision not to let the parade walk along the contentious route last year came as a real surprise. Reject an unelected body by the Parades Commission. They wield arbitrary power. We will not accept it now. Never. The cry is no surrender. No surrender. It was the first time they had ever been prevented from returning by this route. Now, the contentious stretch of road is really very short. It's roughly from the top of that hill behind me to a roundabout just down here. But loyalists and Republicans see this little bit of road very differently. Loyalists see it as a shared space, a main arterial route that takes them home from their 12th of July celebrations. Republicans say that if it is a shared space, most of the houses along the front of this road are nationalist, and so the views of those residents have to be taken into account. Back in the caravan at Camp Twiddell, I meet Bobby Spence. He's been in the Pride of Ardoin band for over 40 years. Why is it so important to walk up that stretch of road? I live there. I've lived in Ardoin from 1969. People, they talk about Ardoin residents, say that, that they don't want the parade down, but I'm an Ardoin resident. The thing that stops this parade is the threat of Republican violence. I asked Brian Kennaway whether last year's Parades Commission, which he served on, took previous Republican violence into account when making its decision. Some loyalists that I've been speaking to say that the main reason, perhaps the only reason, why the parade wasn't allowed back up the road last year was the threat of Republican violence and that the main criteria used by the Parades Commission was to stop that rioting within the Republican community. Is that what happened? That was not the main reason, no. You take all things into consideration, obviously. But I think the main one was there was no sustained conversation. This is Joe Marley. He's the spokesperson for CARA, the Crumlin and Ardoin Residents Association. CARA has the support of Sinn Féin and is recognised by other political parties and, crucially, the Orange Order as the group which best represents the residents of Ardoin. 
Joe told me that one of the reasons many Ardoin residents don't want the parades is because of the troubled and painful history of this area. There have been 50 people murdered in the local area by loyalists. Of those 50, 12 were murdered in the immediate vicinity, some of them on the Crumlin Road. So we have bonds that are affiliated to the loyal orders that actually pay homage to the, some of the people that actually murdered some of those people. And in fact, in one instance, with a bond celebrating a loyalist, walks past the spot in which that, that local man was killed. Joe's own father, Larry Marley, was one of those who was killed by loyalists. A known IRA man in the area, he was shot at the family's front door in Ardoin in 1987 when Joe was just 15. Tensions were so high between the two communities and between the police and Republicans that the funeral had to be cancelled twice for security reasons. I think there's a historic context to it. You go as recently back as 2001, when we had the Holy Cross blockade lasting 16 weeks. I think a lot of that informs people's decisions and attitudes towards um, the Orange Order. The Holy Cross school dispute may have been 13 years ago, but for some people here, it still casts a long shadow and has led to deep bitterness. And that appears to have an effect on attitudes towards parading. the same people that threw bombs and piss at school kids from this area that were walking up and down past their homes and now they're saying it's a shared space and that they should be allowed to spout their sectarianism on another stretch of the road. I mean they need to get real. But within Ardoin there's no love lost between the two groups which both claim to represent the views of the majority of nationalist residents. Whilst to people on the outside, Gark and Kara would appear to represent a similar anti prating viewpoint, there are some crucial differences in their positions. For one thing, Kara is willing to compromise. Kara has told Spotlight that it's willing to facilitate the morning leg of the parade on the 12th of July if the order agrees to withdraw from the return leg. It's this evening parade which in recent years has seen serious violence and rioting in Ardoin. All of this can only be agreed when we have the broad support and endorsement of the residents of Ardoin. But we're confident that if the Orange Order prepared to step up the plate, show some positive leadership, we can resolve this issue. It's not insurmountable. D. Fennell says Gark wants no such compromise. He believes the only answer is an end to all parades along this contested route that Orangemen and their supporters should not be allowed to march either in the morning or the evening. In the past, members of GARC have been willing to break the law in an attempt to stop parades. In 2010, Dee Fennell was arrested after staging a sit-down protest in an attempt to disrupt a march. He refused to pay the court fine and was sent to prison for six days. Protests against parades in Ardoin have often coincided with serious violence. Although Dee Fennell insists there's no link between the Gark protests and the rioting. Well, our position has always been clear. We don't want to see anyone engaging in any violence on the road um, or in these areas. I think when people in Ardoin engage in violence, it takes away from the core of the issue, which is the sectarian parade. But unfortunately, for generations, I mean, for well over a century, loyal order parades have been followed by violence by those who see them as supremacist and triumphalist. Um, and unfortunately, that could, that could be an outcome. The critics of Gark say that in previous years, people are being actively brought in from other areas in order to riot here in Ardoin. Have they? Well, if anyone has any evidence to suggest that Gark members are uh, involved in orchestrating violence, and locally, it would be sometimes put across by people who would support Sinn Féin. I think they should do what their party leaders say that they should do. Contact the PSNN, I'll see them in Legacy Court. There's another crucial difference between Gark and Cara. Cara says it represents only those residents living along or close to the parade route. Gark believes it should be up to all residents of Ardoin to have their voices heard on parades. D. Fennell says that in 2010, they surveyed every resident of Ardoin. They say they got over 1,200 responses, 
and that 70% of those who responded said they wanted no parades whatsoever along the Crumlin Road. Given that that was four years ago, do you think people might be more willing to compromise now? We stated at a public meeting in 2012, we were challenged by um, a Sinn Féin MLA at our public meeting who said about, well, well, that survey was two years ago and anybody could do a survey. And our answer to those people would be, we'll go and do one then. And if we come back with a different answer, put it out there, do a survey and ask the same questions. Spotlight carried out its own ad hoc survey of the houses facing directly onto the 12th of July parade route. We spoke to people in 38 of the 44 occupied houses between Hesketh Drive and Woodvale Road. Five residents didn't want to comment on the dispute. 12 said they wanted all parades banned. Nine said they felt all parades should be allowed. And 12 were open to a compromise. So more than half of those we spoke to were open to some level of parading at certain times along the road. Now, this wasn't a scientific survey, but it does suggest that among some people who live along this road, there is an appetite for a resolution to this issue. And there are those within republicanism and nationalism who say they are willing to compromise to find that solution. The problem is that what seems like a compromise for republicans, for example, allowing parades in the morning but not in the evening, still represents an unacceptable capitulation to loyalists. Who are they to say, we agree to let you walk down a main public road? That's the main road, and you've seen the route yourself. It's five minutes past shop fronts. There's this myth that it goes through a nationalist area. It doesn't. It doesn't. And it doesn't help that even within republicanism, there's a deep division about how to deal with prating. Last month, Dee Fennell stood for the first time in the local elections as an independent Republican. That meant going up against the Sinn Féin political machine. It's election day at City Hall. We caught up with Dee Fennell at the count for the Old Park Ward, which includes Ardoin. He was pleased with his first preferences, 846 votes. For a while, it looked to him as if he might even have a chance at gaining a council seat. There's an outside chance that we get enough number twos from John Larry. So, there, so, you're, so you're still in with the shop? Still in with a chance. Someone else has also pulled well. Julianne Corr, a candidate for the Progressive Unionist Party. She was accompanied by fellow PUP members Billy Hutchinson and Winston Irvine. Julianne Corr rose to prominence in loyalist circles last year by being outspoken on issues like flags and parading, and her message has struck a chord within loyalism. This community and the wider loyalist family have been left behind. Our areas have been neglected. Our people have been pushed to the margins of society. It is only when you lift your anti-orange policy will we as society be able to truly build a better future. Let them home. The count here uh, for the Old Park Ward is a very close run thing. And right here you've got supporters of independent Republican Dee Fennell, who's vigorously opposed to all prating. And in the background, you've got supporters of the PUP candidate, Julie Ann Corr. So it looks like the PUP will take a seat. It looks like Dee Fennell will just miss out, but it does show just how polarized politics have become in this ward. Compared to the success of Sinn Féin in the Old Park Ward, whose candidates got over 4,000 votes, Dee Fennell's vote was small, but significant. The council elections were not a referendum on the prating issue in Ardoin, but there are those who believe that they could nonetheless have an impact on this summer's prating negotiations. It'll be Sinn Féin and Cara who will be leading discussions with the, the loyal orders. Now, the difficulty for them is that Gark will not allow them to reach a solution unless Gark is involved. Because they'll say, whatever they got in electoral terms or how many votes they got, they'll say, look, we're here, we live here, hundreds of people voted for us, you can't reach an agreement without us. So you have a situation now in Ardoin where Sinn Féin or Cara 
are looking over their shoulder at Gark? Yes, yes. And Gark, and Gark will not allow them to reach an accommodation that they're not involved in because they're prepared to take to the streets. They're prepared to come out and block a parade, confront the police. It's late May and talks are ongoing between Cara and the Orange Order. Facilitated by a Catholic and a Protestant bishop, Gark have not been asked to take part. They say they've sent a letter asking to meet the Orange Order, but they've had no reply. If we talk to two groups, and one group says yes, and the other group says no, where, where do you stand then? We're in a no-win situation. Actually, then we become just uh, puppets in internal Republican politics. I don't know. Maybe we're uppity fiends, and they don't want us to talk to uppity fiends. They want to talk to people that can be manipulated, controlled, and they'll have a possibility of giving them everything that they want. One of the obstacles to finding a solution here seems to be that there's competition and infighting within republicanism. One thing is clear though, if a solution isn't found soon, there could be serious repercussions. If this camp is still here on the 12th of July, it could be a magnet for trouble. And what happens then between these two communities is anyone's guess. Last week, rumours began circulating that there could be a significant development in the parading dispute at Ardoin. Orangemen had attempted for the fifth time to finish their march past the Ardoin shops in a morning parade, this time early on Saturday the 7th of June. It would come down to another determination by the new Parades Commission. It was an unenviable choice. Allowing the parade past the shops would mean the dismantling of Camp Twadell but it was also likely to provoke a furious reaction from Ardoin residents. We caught up with GARC members as they left a meeting with the Parades Commission. Well, basically, we just told them at point blank that if there was any attempts to uh, facilitate and allow these uh, people to uh, march back up the Crumlin Road against the wishes of the vast majority of the people from Ardoin, that we would be left with no other option would be to mobilise people in their thousands, uh, as we have proved we are more than capable of doing. Is there some kind of implicit threat of violence in that, that, that some of those people might become violent? The situation is, is then, if we can't stop it on our own, then we call for people to come along who suffer at the hands of the same injustices. And uh, we've done it in the past and we'll do it again. Do you feel that the Parades Commission were listening to what you were saying? Did they take it on board? Believe you me, they listened. Last Wednesday, we went to Camp Twadell just as the decision was being announced. It didn't go the way the Loyalists wanted. The parade on Saturday was not allowed to march back up the Crumlin Road. There's a lot of anger within the community, a lot of anger. But again, this just seems to be appeasement of violent Republican extremists at any cost to our culture and our community. That night, the Loyalists gathered once again. Compared to the march two weeks ago, this protest march was more sombre and more tense. The last time I was here at the other protest march, there was, there was a more kind of jovial atmosphere, but it feels a bit different tonight. It does indeed, that, and it, it, it feels that my heart's been ripped out of my, my body. It's just my culture and my heart is, it's, it's terrible. Over the following days, the protest marches continued and they remained peaceful. But just as a new set of political talks are due to begin leading up to the 12th of July, it's clear that in this part of Belfast, on both sides, compromise is a commodity in short supply. And without it, Ardoin could be in for another long, hot summer.